Uh, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Good to be here, isn't it? Yes. I'm so um, aware, or I'm, I've been made so aware of, of, of what a privilege it is to be able to come and worship. You know, when we read of what's going on in, with Myanmar, the Myanmar people and, and their situation, faint strangers in a foreign land, you know, it's been, it's been a real trial for them. And um, we're so blessed to be able to come here and uh, nobody says you can't do that, and nobody threatens us with a, a gun or a bomb, and, um, and we're here, and the Lord is here too. Amen. Yes, amen. And uh, well, it's been a bit of a week, one way and another, I'll let you know. Hands up all those who've had a bit of a week, one way and another. Yes, I knew I wasn't on my own. <laughs> oh, dear. No, no. <laughs> well, my week, um, my week involved two things that I thought I'd just share with you because uh, I don't know about you, but I, don't, I can't always find the words nowadays. You know, I, I find that I ca- I'm searching for the word or the wrong word comes out. And, 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 and this is a classic example. I, uh, I, I want to encourage you with this. I popped round to see my neighbours at the beginning of the week. And uh, I needed to borrow some eggs if they had some. And they did have some, praise the Lord. And uh, my neighbour welcomed me into the, into the front door. Uh, and I was wiping my feet on the mat. And I said, oh, shall I take my trousers off? <laughs> I walk in and there's a husband sat right, right in there, and he was, he's in tux. I've got a WhatsApp off him saying, do you want Shirley's trousers back? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. And then, um, uh, I don't know whether it was the same evening or whatever, but it was very close. Um, we had curry for tea. And um, I like hot curry and Michael likes cold curry. <laughs> if you know what I mean. And so I had some um, uh, dried chili peppers, whole chili, chili peppers in my curry. And, um, oh, I love them. I love hot, oh, really spicy curry. And so, uh, and I'm, I'm heating up here. My glasses are getting steamed up. <laughs> can, can somebody get me a tissue, please? Talking about, talking about curry, that's right. Anyway, I, uh, I, 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 I I picked this, um, this, thank you, this chili out of my curry and I sucked it, you know? And, uh, and then next, next minute, well, you know col- chili has consequences. Yeah. Next minute, I turned to Michael and I said, oh, it's given me heli chickups. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I don't know where it comes from, do you? I just don't know where it comes from. It just sort of, it just pops out my mouth and embarrasses me before I even have time to say Jack Robinson. Anyway, I'm sure that that will happen today because I am a, I seem to be be becoming a master at spoonerisms. That you know where you you switch around the first letter of each word. So anyway, we'll we'll see how we get on. (laughs) Ah, dear. So I'm going to be returning to 1 Peter, if you want to find that in your Bible. So I don't think we're going to go to it just for a minute. Um, well, it's been a long time since, uh, since I actually spoke from this, um, uh, quite a long time ago. But I was um, wondering what to, what to uh, speak about today. And I'm aware that Passover is apo- approaching, isn't it? Is a poaching. <laughs> Oh, it'll get better. I can assure you, it'll get better. The, we're, we're, we're looking forward to that. It's at the end of, of April, and, um, and I, I've been asked to speak on, on that, the Shabbat just before it starts on the Monday, the 22nd. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm finding, I'm thinking a lot about Passover, 
and about what it means and about all the, the elements of it. And quite frankly, it's enormous. I, I knew it was, but when you start thinking about it in order to try and put something down which will last 45 minutes, I mean, it's just, it's just so big. But anyway, I'm going to do my best. But I've been thinking about it. And, um, and I, um, I was just looking at all this thing, and I, and I went to Peter, and I realized that what, what I need to say today is linked to the scripture that I'm going to refer to in Peter. And um, it's all about those, those uh, excuse me, I'm going to have to blow my nose. <laughs> That's better. No one can accuse me of not being human. <laughs> the Passover Pesach contains essentially um, two of the most monumental events, most of the, two of the most phenomenal events in the history of mankind, in the heavens and on the earth. And they have changed, both of those changed the course of humanity forever. And there's one, one word from these events that, 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 that flows through both of them and which um, I believe it attaches itself irrevocably to the celebration of Passover. And that word is salvation. The salvation of the Jewish nation in the story of their journey from slavery and captivity in Egypt to be brought into freedom in the promised land and the salvation by grace released at the cross in the story of the journey undertaken by Yeshua to go from life to death so that in and through him we can journey from death to life and ultimately to eternal life. This um, Passover, this, this subject, this happening, this event is so huge and so enormous that it is virtually impossible to fully describe in words, isn't it? But um, we're going to give it a go. It, and it's so much more than a story to tickle our ears. You know, we don't really, uh, we're at the stage where we don't want our ears tickled, do we? We don't want to be told things just for the sake of it. We, we really want truth. I want truth. I want the, um, the, the meat of the word to be made manifest to me. I want to understand at a deeper level. I don't just want to do Passover. I don't just want to celebrate a feast. I want to understand it at a deeper level. And I think that for us all, every time we celebrate what these feasts, we understand them at a deeper level. And, and isn't that how God works? He constantly has new things. We cannot exhaust him. We, we, we can never exhaust his wealth in every aspect of our lives. So, it speaks for me of two events, both thousands of years apart. In the history of the same people, the Jewish nation, yet impacting the entirety of the heavens and the earth, of nations and peoples, of the Most High God, Adonai Elohim, and his op opposing destroyer, whom we know to be Satan, with a small s. Two events which speak of a symphony of similar threads. You can tell, can't you, that I started speaking about something that was about four paragraphs on. <laughs> it doesn't go to off to do to go off piste, you know. I've, I've realized this, but it's worth repeating that it's we're talking about two events which speak of uh, w the way I saw it was a symphony of threads, which weave together to produce a tapestry through which is planned for and provided a hope and a means of salvation for every man, woman and child in creation. So, going to 1 Peter, we last finished in verse 9. We discussed uh, some of the aspects of what our faith in God meant, and we finished at verse 9 with, for you are receiving 
the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, Peter's speaking to those who have committed their lives to Yeshua, isn't he? Is he, is he speaking to the unsaved? I don't think so. He's writing a, a, a letter to be read by those who are in the Lord in order to encourage them, isn't he? So he's talking to saved people. Those who've committed their lives to Yeshua who have become believers and therefore are saved. They've received the salvation of their souls in accordance with the promises of God. Romans 10 verse 9 if you declare with your mouth Yeshua is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. It's, it's a done deed, isn't it? Yeah. But it seems that salvation is one of those paradoxical words that speaks of two things at the same time. Now, the Bible is full of them. I've, I've spoken about this before, of how God uses one word that speaks of two things, or of two actions, or has two, two meanings to the same word, all at the same time. Uh, but I'm not going to go into, into the detail of that, as I don't want to get sidetracked just now. And uh, what I want to say is that, that, that salvation is both an event and a living reality. An event and a living reality. Salvation comes to us first, when we embrace Yeshua, I hope everybody here has embraced Yeshua and has received salvation. Through our repentance and his forgiveness of our sins, when we're effectively washed in the blood of Yeshua, because his blood is what flowed from the cross for our forgiveness, for our sins. And at that moment, we are accepted into relationship with Abba Father, God the Father, through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are promised eternal life, aren't we? But there's so much more to it. Because being saved involves an ongoing working out or outworking of this salvation. It's, it's, it's never static in the Lord, is it? You know, we sometimes feel we've come into a backwater or that we're in a cul-de-sac or that we've lost our way, but actually we, there is never a full stop until the very end, and then it's just for a minute moment when we step from this life into the next. You know, it's all with God. We're all, there's more, isn't there? <laughs> there's always more with God. Always. And we can, you know, if, if we don't grasp that, then it's so easy to become a bystander and an onlooker instead of a partaker. That was for nothing, that bit then. <laughs> if it were not so that salvation involves an outworking, then much of the New Testament could be just dispensed with or redundant. How much of the, the New, New Testament scriptures urge us to put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light, urge us to um, put off the old and put on the new, to do this, to do that, to not do this, to not do that. The whole, the, the, the whole of the New Testament scriptures are about how to live as, as a believer, aren't they? They encourage us to outwork our salvation. And once saved, a process begins. It's just the start, salvation. It's just the start of a process of learning, of revealing, of refining, and of growing. All those things and many, many more things that, um, that, that we begin to discover are happening as we go along. And it, I love the way that God just does things so naturally. We, we're not aware of him most of the time, 
except where, you know, the odd time. But most of the time, he's not saying, look at that, or what about this, or pay attention. He, he, it's like we just live our lives, we talk to people, we speak we read the books, we read, we read the Bible, we, we, we pray, we worship, we spend time with, in fellowship or on our own, we go for a walk, we look at the flowers, we contemplate the clouds, and God somehow speaks to us in and through it all. He has an amazingly supernatural way of teaching us through the natural things. And it's, it's a process also of honing our understanding and our obedience, which causes then our way of life to change, to be more in line with the word of God. Because if you were anything like me when I got saved, I knew nothing about God except church. I knew what church was and I hated it. I didn't want to be a part of it but I did want to know who God was. And we find that we're continually then moving towards a goal. And what is the goal? Well, I think the goal is eternal life. Because I don't think that until that moment when we step across the threshold, that, that we stop. I just don't think that God stops working on our case. I mean, I don't know who the oldest person in this room is, but I know that if I asked you to tell me, is God still moving in your life, you would say, if you're the oldest person. And I'm looking, look at looking at anybody. <laughs> because that's how God is, isn't it? It's how he works. He's constantly, constantly saying, come on, come on, let's do this together. Let's, let's look at this. What about that? Ooh, what about that? <laughs> I hear that more, on, more than the others, I'm afraid. Okay, so we're going to pick up. Oh, no, 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 I'm rushing ahead of myself. <laughs> and in this process, we... Oh, no. <laughs> It just doesn't do, does it, to go off piste? It just doesn't do. <laughs> do you? <laughs> so I was saying about the paradox, wasn't I? Salvation is a paradox. Can you see the paradox that I'm talking about? That it's a done deal, but at the same time, it's a deal that starts there and carries on until it's it, eternal life. M and we don't achieve it until we pass through into glory, when he says there is perfect, perfection. And sometimes we behave badly, don't we? We indulge our carnal or our human nature. We speak words in haste or in anger. Or we find ourselves being jealous of one another. All those human traits. But then we find ourselves reading the word don't we, which says anger is cruel and fury overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? Or we read the word that says a gentle answer turns away wrath, and we think, I want to be one who isn't furious, who doesn't get angry, who doesn't take offense. I want to have the gentle answer that will turn away wrath. And with that revelation comes a desire to change, and God comes in and gives you the ability to change. And we repent, and we ask the Lord to help, and he does, because he wants us to comply with his word. And we find we lack the ability to see things ob objectively sometimes. We have a problem, or we have an issue, and we can't see a way through. We can't find the right decision and then we find ourselves reading first about Solomon and then about Yeshua, how they both operated in and were noted by all to have wisdom in all their dealings. And we realize, hey, that's what I need. That, that's what I need. I remember about 20 years ago, I realized I needed wisdom. And I began 
to fulfill the scripture in James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. He doesn't say, don't be so stupid. He doesn't say, oh, you, you know, dummy, does he? He says, ah, oh, you've realized that you need something only I can give you. Yeah, take it without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Ask, and you shall receive. And so, we begin our lifelong journey of working out our salvation <coughs> towards that goal of our faith, as Peter describes it, the salvation of your soul. In the second book of Peter, which I spoke about, I think about 18 years ago, <laughs> when we were still in there. Oh no, oh, was as long as, I don't know, anyway. Long time ago, Peter speaks of, of those aspects of, um, good, of, um, of desirable disciplines, I put them as, desirable aspects of discipline that he says we should um, embrace within our walk, um, which add to our salvation. And as I was looking at them, I was thinking, I bet there's hardly any of us in here that had any of those before we were saved. I'm going to read them to you. This is, and this is for your information from uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And to goodness, add knowledge. And to knowledge, add self-control. And to self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, mutual affection or brotherly love. <laughs> and to brotherly love, love. Love that reflects the love of the Father through the Son by the Spirit. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Yeshua Messiah it's a challenge isn't it this salvation lark it really is it's a challenge because it demands of us it demands that we put aside ourselves and our carnal human nature and choose that which God says is desirable for us to choose and walk in. So let's go now to 1 Peter 1, starting at verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of God in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. Well, I thought, well, well. <laughs> What's Michael preaching on at the moment? The prophets. And he's teaching us a lot of good stuff. It's really good stuff, Michael, about the prophets. And I, so I was delighted to realize and find out that this scripture is, um, is, is timely. It complements what Michael's teaching us and what he's been saying. And I, I think it was only last week that, that Michael told us that God reveals what he wants to do to his prophets, doesn't he? Do you remember he said that? He shares his plans and purposes with those who share his heart and who desire to do his service, no matter what the cost. And that was from Amos 3, verse 7, which says, Surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. So, the picture we have is that, that Peter's telling us that the prophets, they were searching intently with everything they had. They were searching with the greatest care, trying to find out more about 
the coming Messiah, about when he would appear, the time and the circumstances surrounding it. And I guess that they would have been looking at all sorts of things, the moon, the stars, the heavenly realms. They'd be looking at at the the words that were already written and that they had in the Tanakh, in in the Torah, uh, the first five books, and then they would be looking at, at, at earlier prophets and writings, I imagine, to try and piece together the jigsaw of when is he coming? Where is he coming? What will be the circumstances? How will it be? You know, I want to be first to tell everybody. <laughs> I'm sure that wasn't then there. <laughs> That's very human though, isn't it? <laughs> God had already been speaking to the prophets about Yeshua. He was dropping hints about his coming all through scriptures. And as this scripture we're looking at says, so the prophets searched intently, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of God in them was pointing. And that's just a little aside. Let's not make the mistake of believing that the Holy Spirit who came to the upper room believers at Shavuot was not around in the days recorded in the Tanakh, the Old Testament scriptures. I, if you, if you look with these glasses on of, of looking for the Holy Spirit in each person, you see that scripture confirms that the Spirit of God was in those men and women who cleaved to God. Remember Deborah? And what about Anna, who took hold of Yeshua, aged uh, aged a few days, and prophesied over him? Those who served him, whether simply and faithfully, Job was a simple man, wasn't he? A faithful man, but the Spirit of God was in him. Or if they had an office, a position, a Levite, for instance. Or or if they spoke the word of the Lord before him. The Holy Spirit was around. Let's Let's not believe the lie, okay? The New Testament lie that's about. And I'm sure that that those prophets who were searching were not simply wanting to satisfy their own curiosity. Do you think that they would be doing it for their own sake? I don't. They had a burning, a desire to to find out in order uh, for a reason. And they searched diligently. They, They needed to lay the foundations for the understanding of Yeshua's coming. Not just for the Jewish people but for the entire world, for the nations, for the individuals who would receive the message of God's salvation. In verse 12, it says, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. Who are those described there as you? Well, Paul says first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, doesn't he? But that includes both Jew and Gentile. The revelation of Yeshua's coming was ultimately for every human being in the world. So that, having been foretold, forewarned, and fulfilled, there can be no argument that Yeshua is God incarnate. Amen? Amen. The prophets spoke of those things revealed by God to them, and then those who had already been saved preached of those things and preach of those things in order that we, over 2,000 years later, can understand and in the future, yet will understand. 
Peter says again, verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Charles Spurgeon much more eloquently describes this in words that we can understand. Because I found I had to read that several times before I got a grip on it. And then I thought, I need a little bit more enlightenment here. And I like Charles. He's a good lad, you know. There has been no new salvation, full stop. There has been a change in the messengers, but they have all spoken of one thing. And though their tidings have been more clearly understood in these latter days, the substance of the good news is still the same. The Old Testament and the New are one, inspired by the same spirit and filled with the same subject, namely the one promised Messiah. The prophets foretold what the apostles reported. I love that. The seers looked forward and the evangelists looked backward. <laughs> Their eyes met at one place. They see eye to eye and both behold the cross. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Isn't that great? <laughs> and, and he's a big man, you know, and he's got this booming voice, and I can just imagine what it would have sounded like. And we're, oh! <laughs> but it's so true. It's so true. I want to ask you, did you hear the gospel when you were saved? Or, like me, did you read it? I read it. I, I, the Lord found me just through a book and a, a lonely prayer, and then going to a church, sitting on my own, and being filled by the, with the Spirit, saying at last, yes, yes, that's all I said. And I was filled with the Spirit. So I didn't hear the gospel, although I'd probably sat in dry sermons all my early life, but I read about Yeshua. Oh, and my heart burnt to know him, and, and my life changed. What I heard so loudly was that God took my place. Yeshua died on the cross for my sins. And you know what? When it comes down to us as individuals, that's what it's about. It's about God and me. Here, it's God and us. We're here as a congregation, but actually, when we're on our own, it's the Lord and me. And so I can say, that at that moment it was about him taking my place. When he went to the cross, he took my sins with him. And of course, he took yours. Romans 5 verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Yeshua died for us. It took many years for me to realize that, that this act was the meaning of the word atonement. That that, that act, that, 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 that him taking my place was what atonement means. Verse 12 in Peter goes on to say, even angels long to look into these things. <laughs> Even angels long to look into these things. What is it that they long to look at? What is it that they struggle to understand? When they are God's created spirit beings, created to be with him, to serve him, to be around his throne of grace, to be worshipping him, I would have anticipated that the angels knew all things, wouldn't you? Most, most, most of it. 
Why do they struggle wanting to know more about it? Have you ever noticed that you're walking along the street and somebody's there going, and what happens? Everybody goes. Yeah. <laughs> Don't they? <laughs> or somebody's going, and the next person comes around and goes, We have an innate curiosity, don't we? We have a curiosity that needs to be satisfied, each one of us. It's, it's within us. It's part of human nature. And it's this innate curiosity that we need to use to search with the angels as they pry into the underlying meaning of the fact and doctrine of atonement. That's what they're looking at. That's what they want to know, the meaning of atonement. Spurgeon describes them. This is how he describes these angels. He says, they stand at the cross foot, ravished, astounded, and all heaven to this day has never ceased its amazement at the perfect, dying Son of God made sin for men. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon, clap in heaven. The angels know that Yeshua is perfect and spotless, don't they? They see him in heaven. They saw him before he went to earth. He's sinless and he's spotless. The angels know that he does not have any sin in him. The angels also know that man is sinful, and all men fall short of God's glory. They know that man deserves the judgment of God for his sins. Is that right? Yet God himself makes a decision without telling the angels to pay the price for those sins. The price being a sacrifice unto death for a spotless lamb, an unblemished lamb, this time, once and for all, of the entire human race. Yeshua makes atonement ahead of time for sinful man so that for the believer, his due judgment has already been satisfied. And that's for each one of us here, because none of us was around when he came to earth. He did it over 2,000 years ago for each one of us to relieve us from our due judgment for the sins that we commit. Now, I'm not talking about the need to repent, the need to ask God's forgiveness. I take that as read. We know that that's part of our prayers. But it, the judgment has been paid for by the atonement. <coughs> the angels long to look into these things because these things are the sole realm and concern of the creator, not the created. Romans 11.34 says, Who has known the mind of the Lord? And neither men nor angels can know the mind of the Lord. Charles says again, I think if I saw an angel intently gazing upon any object, if I were a passerby, I should stop and look too. <laughs> I think if I saw an angel... <laughs> <laughs> that would just be enough for me. <laughs> so back in verse 9 again, Peter says a reminder that we are receiving the goal of our faith, which is the salvation of our souls. Well, I put it to you that it's not until the end of the race that the winner receives the prize. Amen? Unless the race is entered, 
There are no runners, therefore no winners. Therefore, a prize cannot be offered. Is that fair? And therefore, there's a lot of therefores in these, these few words, but therefore, in this context, we must live our life as being a part of a race. Within and unto salvation. Choosing to please God, choosing to change on the inside to reflect God's nature, and choosing to outwork the knowledge of God in all we are, every day of our lives. And going on to verse 13, Peter says, therefore, I like therefore, it's a good <laughs> word. Somebody said, you always ask what it's there for. <laughs> With minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Yeshua Messiah is revealed at his coming. Well, it reminded me when I did this, when I wrote that, very soon after I gave my heart to Yeshua, 40 years ago, over 40 years ago, a godly, respect-worthy couple prayed for me. The lady was profoundly deaf and had been from birth, but she had such an intimate and close and precious relationship with God that she was one of those people that just drew people to her. It was like the Spirit of God was so alive and so enormous in her that, that you were just drawn like a, f a filing to a magnet. I nearly said a miling to a fagnet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. And, and so it was a, a real privilege for them to pray for me. And um, she really felt she had the word of the Lord for me. And she said that she believed I would be one who would witness the return of the Lord. And as a young believer, that was a pretty impressive thing to have spoken over you. But actually, over 40 years on, I, I'm pretty sure it was actually more a blessed thought than um, a, a word from the Lord, but bless her anyway, because it's really given me an excitement about the return of the Lord all these years, which has not diminished at all. And it's reminded me that Yeshua will return. It's easy to forget, isn't it? It's, it's something we don't think about every day or all the time or very often, that Yeshua's coming back. And I, I'm so excited for this to happen, whether I'm here to see it or whether I'm not, whether I've already gone to glory, because it is written, and the word remains forever. Was it grass will wither and flowers will fall or fade, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. And it's written, and I'm going to read you from Daniel 13, verse 13. Michael will be very impressed at this, that I'm going into Daniel. I mean, <laughs> that's murky waters for one such as me. <laughs> verse 13 of chapter 13. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And Matthew 24, verse 27 for as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 30, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. 
and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. We will meet him in the air, so he'll gather us from the heavens. Daniel the prophet wrote what he saw, and Matthew the apostle endorsed and affirmed it in context of what they both were seeing. The seers looked forward and the evangelists looked backward. Their eyes meet at one place. They see eye to eye and both behold the cross. And so Peter encourages us to get ready, doesn't he? That's what he's doing, to ensure that our minds, that we keep on the job, keep on the lookout, keep ready, keep excited. It's hard sometimes, I know. But that we keep our minds alert and fully sober, which means to be discreet and keep watch and not drink too much wine as well. (laughs) (laughs) To set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Yeshua Messiah is revealed at his coming. It's interesting, isn't it? These scriptures just are leading us and leading us, and leading us. And we've already been told in John 1 that out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given, or blessing upon blessing. But I'm using the word grace because I'm so excited that there is yet another grace to come, according to this scripture. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Yeshua is revealed at his coming. There's a grace that's yet to be revealed. Understanding and keeping the the atonement of Yeshua, very central in our framework of thinking, is a very healthy foundation for the outworking of our salvation. Now, how do I say that again? It's when, the ato- when what, what, what Messiah has done for us, when what Yeshua achieved for us on that cross at Calvary is the center of our framework or the foundation for our outworking of our salvation. It's a very safe place to be. It's not based on the whims of man. It's not based on on a on a um, a good idea. It's not based on somebody's preferences. It's based on what has Yeshua done for me. He died for my sins, and it all comes from there. Because so many scriptures then tell you because, for, in order to. Oswald Chambers sums this up. He's another friend of mine. I spend a lot of time with Oswald. (laughs) It's got to be a Yorkshire accent with Oswald, doesn't it? (laughs) Although he was Scottish. (laughs) I just think Oswald. It's It's a Yorkshire accent. Anyway, he says about the atonement and how important it is for us. He asks the question, and this is for all of us, Am I allowing my spiritual life to waste away? Or am I focused, bringing everything to one central point, the atonement of Yeshua? I must take time to realize what this central point of power is. What is the greatest source of power in my life? Is it my work? my service, my sacrifice for others? Or is it my striving to work for God? It should be none of these. What ought to exert the greatest power in my life is the atonement of the Lord. It is not on what we spend the most time that molds us the most but whatever exerts the most power over us. Just going to say that last bit again. It is not 
on what we spend the most time that molds us, the most, but whatever exerts the most power over us. Now, I, I can be honest with you and say that over recent years, with, rec with the events and the situations and the trials and the troubles and the toils and the circumstances we've had to deal with, that they have been enough to allow my eyes to look away from the cross sometimes. And I realize that I've been struggling. And you know, I've realized that it's so easy to lose one's first love. It's so easy to withdraw and grow cool. First, it's just at first, it's just a coolness. And for those of you who are married, you know that that can happen in a marriage as well. You just lose your cool, you just lose your ardor, and you, you stop being as, as complimentary or as appreciative or as thankful or as, as loving and as nurturing as perhaps you, you were. Well, it's like that with God, isn't it? When we lose our first love. It's all part of our human frailty. Um, but God just seems a little bit further away than, than he did before. And I, I'm, I'm glad that, 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 that I've been battling with this for a few months now. But this, doing this, preparing this word has really brought me to an understanding that, that, that I now know what my focus needs to be. And, and I'm looking forward to this celebration of Passover. Pesach, because I want to rediscover my first love, and I want to spend time considering those two events that brought forth my salvation. And for us as a church, I, I, I urge us all to, to look forward to this time and to everything that, that, that it will it will encompass and teach us and help us to understand in remembrance of what has gone before in our case uh, in order that we can, we can um, deepen our relationship, deepen our understanding and, and deepen our love for God. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you always. He never holds us away. He always is waiting for us to make the first move. So let's once more draw near to God, remembering God's faithfulness and his grace in bringing life out of death in Israel's history, and God's faithfulness and grace in bringing life out of death through the atonement on the cross. Amen.